Our word for today is omnipotence. Two parts of that word, omnipotence, all-powerful. Our God is the all-powerful God. I was reading in my devotions this morning, and there were at least five instances where God displayed his power through Christ. One was raising Jairus' daughter from the grave. Another was feeding 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fishes. Another was a time when a lady just watched up and touched the hem of his garment and was healed. God is a God of power. Jesus walked on the water. I haven't been able to do that. I've tried, but it doesn't work. He was walking right past the ship in the storm, and when he got in the ship, the storm stopped. He is the God of power, all-powerful God. Now, if God cannot do what he wills to do, if God cannot perform his purposes, then he cannot be God. If Jesus could not do these things, he couldn't be God. If Jesus could not rise from the dead the third day, he couldn't be God because he had promised to do so. He had purposed to do so, and it was God's plan that he do so. He had the power to do it. He is all-powerful, omnipotent. Now, I want to give you a definition of omnipotence. What is it all about? When we talk about God being all-powerful, the all-powerful God, what are we talking about? Remember the person who came along and and said, can God create a rock that is so big that he can't lift it up? Now that is sort of a stupid question. Because that shows that they really don't understand God's power. And uh, let's look at this definition and understand what is involved in God exercising his power to do something. The power of God is his ability and strength to bring to pass whatever he pleases and whatever his infinite wisdom directs and whatever his holiness allows. Now I want to go over that definition a little bit with you because that is key for our understanding. Remember when the Lord was tempted in the wilderness 40 days, 40 nights? At the end of those times, he was hungry, and the the devil came to him and said, turn that stone into bread and solve your hunger problem. Now, the question would be, could Jesus have done that? The answer is, certainly he could. He had the power to do it. But the question was, was that God's will? Does that fit into the will and plan of God? Does it fit into God's holiness? into God's purpose. You see, Jesus could selfishly have said, yes, I can do that, I will do that, for his own selfish gratification, but he didn't do it because it didn't fit into the holiness of God and the infinite wisdom of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus knew holiness was more important than satisfying the physical appetite. So he did not do it. The power of God is his ability and strength to bring to pass, first of all, whatever he pleases. He can do whatever he wants. And as we talk about God and his holiness, if God does something, it is always right. God always acts in holiness. He acts in basis of his wisdom. Now, God could have created a solar system. He had the power to do that. He willed to do it, and he did it. And it satisfied his wisdom. It satisfied his holiness. He always acts with those two things in mind. He does not exercise power indefinitely or just at whim. You know, there are some interesting fables about Jesus when he was a boy, how he would carve out a little bird and blow into it and it would fly away. Well, those are fables. Why would he do that? He wouldn't have to do that. He could just say, I want a bird, and it would occur in his hand. He had the power to do things. But he always acts in accordance to his will, and he always acts in accordance to his holiness. 
So we want to consider today six aspects of God's power, God's omnipotence, the all-powerfulness of God. And the first thing we're going to see is that God has inherent power. Power is just part of his being. He has that power, that ability to do whatever he wants. There's a, a double testimony given in Psalm chapter Psalm 62 and verse 11. It, it, that psalm concludes with this verse. It says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to the Lord. Or literally, power is inherent in the very being of God. God is all-powerful, omnipotent. And he has the ability and strength to do whatever he pleases in conformity to his wisdom and his holiness. So when we think about God's power in this testimony, first he says there's two things here. First is scripture. And that's the phrase God has spoken. Secondly, there's nature is the second testimony that's in this psalm. Twice have I heard this. In other words, God creates it. And then we can see it. No wonder the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, the glorious power of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. It shows his power. No wonder Paul, in writing to the Romans, says that the invisible things of him are seen in creation so that all are without excuse. There's not a single person who ever has lived or ever will live on this planet, who cannot see the power of God visibly in the creation that God has made all around him. We get up in the morning, and we look at the sunrise coming up, and we realize that that happens because God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. We watch the sun through the day, it goes down, and we see it setting in this beautiful, picturesque things, and all of a sudden we realize our God is all-powerful. We get in the telescope and we look at the universe, the things that God has created, and we realize our God is all-powerful. He is seen in what he has created, and he had just to speak it, and it came to pass. Psalm 18 gives a testimony of this in verses 13 through 15. Let me read that. The Lord also thundered in the heavens... And the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yes, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomforted them. Then the channels of water were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. It combines the idea that God speaks, and God then is seen in what he has created. Now, there's two things involved in this illustration that he gives in Psalm 18. One is either an earthquake or a volcano. Did you know that the the moderate earthquake, just a little moderate earthquake that we probably wouldn't even know was taking place, is 100,000 times more powerful than an atomic bomb? Our God controls those things. He says so in the Bible. The second illustration is that of a a thunderstorm or a little tornado that's produced in a hurricane. Did you know that the moderate little hurricane, not the big guys, but the little moderate ones, will lift 60 million tons of water and generate more power in ten every 10 seconds than all the electrical power that is produced in the United States in a whole year. Just a little bit. God is all-powerful. All power belongs to him. And that's what he says. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this. Power belongs or is inherent in the Lord. It's even inherent in his name. Think about God's name. The Almighty. The mighty God. They all speak of God's power. Jesus, when he spoke of his return, pictures the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. He is the all-powerful one. 
In the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk had a, a vision of God's power and it caused him to pray for revival among the people of Israel. And as he saw this, this is what it says in Habakkuk 3. His glory covered the heavens and the earth. The earth was full of his praise. His brightness was as the light. And there was the hiding of his power. I like that little phrase. There was the hiding of his power. In other words, God only reveals a small portion of his power. We can look at the universe and see what God has created. But it's just a little glimpse that we get. And just think about it. That little question that was asked by the the skeptic was, can God create a stone bigger than what he can lift? Well, the answer is very simple. God created a universe, and the Bible says he holds it in his hand. He is the all-powerful God inherent in his nature. Secondly, we see God's creative power. We've talked a little bit about his creative power, but let's look at it a little bit better. The Bible does not seek to prove that God exists. It basically assumes God existence. For instance, the Bible starts out, it doesn't have a book on how we know there is a God. There's no book like that. It simply says, in the beginning, God created. It assumes the existence of God. God exists. And God did something. So the Bible in looks at creation as a fact that is that is there. It starts with the proposition, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 89 goes on to show this, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, for as for the world and the fullness thereof, you have founded them, the north and the south, you have created them. In other words, the fact of creation is what is seen in Scripture. God did it. And now we can sit back and enjoy what God has done. I do not have to prove that a certain person wrote the book I'm going to sit down and read. I don't have to say, well, how do I know that author exists? Well, he wrote the book. When I sing a song, I don't have to figure out, well, who was this author and how do I know he existed? Maybe maybe he didn't really exist and how did that come to be? I don't do that. I assume the author of the hymn existed. I accept it by faith. And when we come to the word of God, we accept it by faith. Now, look at the means of God's creation. How did God do this creative work, his creative power? Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a little insight into it. It says in verse 3, Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, what God spoke. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Literally, it is saying, God created what he did out of nothing. There was nothing there, and God made it all. He is all-powerful in his creative work. An omnipotent God has but simply to speak a word and create a universe. He can do that because he is omnipotent, all-powerful. There's no Big Bang. There's no evolution involved in it. God speaks. Just the voice of God. Let there be light, and there's light. Let there be fish, and there's fish. Let there be birds, and there's birds. Let there be living creatures, and there they are. God, through his creative power, created all these animals after their kind. Which simply means he made each one of them distinctly and individually. He made birds birds. He made animals animals. He didn't have a a little amoeba creeping up, becoming a creature, becoming something else, then flying away. He didn't do it that way. He spoke and it happened. He has the power to do that. Then he makes man after his own image. He fashions man's body with his own hands out of the dust of the ground. You know the the old saying, dust to dust, ashes to ashes? And that's really when you think about man's body, what is it? It is composed chemically, basically, of the dust of the ground. 
that's, that's what it is. And the, the chemical composition is there. But God, in designing this human being, put all the systems of this body in order so that the body works and functions. He made all the systems that are needed for the functioning of this human body. The medical science looks at the body and they can define it. They can tell what's going to happen here and there. And they know what the, the body, how the body works, how the blood systems work, how everything works, how the digestive systems work. They, he knows God made it all. And he did it in just a moment. And he creates man after his own image. Now, we, how do we understand this? Can we explain it? No, not really. But are we supposed to explain it? Not really. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 shows that we are to accept his work of creation by faith. Because it says, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We just accept the fact that God Word says this is what he did, so that's what happened. And why can he do this? Because he's all-powerful. Well, let's go on a little bit further. And not only see that, but see God in his preserving power. Here's the creation that he's made. And he preserves his creation by his omnipotence. He's not not only able to create something... But he preserves what he creates. Notice what the scripture says, Psalm 36, 3. Lord, you preserve man and beast. Hebrews 1, 3. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Just as he created things by his word of his power, he preserves it by the word of his power. He upholds it. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says this, By him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And that word consist means to hold together, to preserve it. He preserves his creation The universe works because God created it to work, and God keeps it working. You don't have to call up some, he doesn't have to call up some celestial repairman to to fix up the universe. He controls it all. He preserves it all. Christ exercises that sovereign, preserving power to hold the universe together. And Jesus applies God's preserving power to us. Just think about what he said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. In verse 26, he said, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor they gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are not you much better than they? In other words, here's God creating the birds, and and uh, he, he, he don't have to go out and somehow plant their seeds and let them grow. They, they find the seeds we've planted. They, they find their food and God's provision of it for them. And God is saying, if, if I'm taking care of little birds, can I take care of you big birds? You people? Certainly he can. He has the power to do that. It is his preserving power. And then in verse 30 of Matthew 6, it says, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? In other words, God not only has the power to take care of the grass, he has the power to take care of you and me. He is a preserving, omnipotent, sovereign God. Now let's go on. And just a step further from his preserving power is his controlling power. God is in control of things. Now the theistic evolutionist sort of gives us the idea that God creates everything and he just lets it go and he sits back and he, he ignores what he has created. He doesn't really care about his creation. 
Now that's what they teach. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God not only creates his creation, but he controls his creation. For 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 6 and 7 show that, that this is true. Now you know what holds back that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now hinders will hinder until he's taken out of the way. And it's talking about a coming day of tribulation on the earth. Seven years of tribulation. The day of the Lord. The day of judgment. It's talking about the fact that God is in control of what's happening. Not only in his creation, but in his world. He's in charge of things. And presently, God is restraining Satan. And Satan's sinful purposes for mankind. He is holding him back. Now, how does he do this? He does it through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one doing that. How does the Holy Spirit do it? He indwells believers. And he uses believers as the hindrance to Satan's program in the world. That's why the devil doesn't like us. That's why the unsaved world does not like Bible-believing Christians. Because we have a philosophy that is totally different and totally convicting of their sinfulness. So they don't like us around. And just think, when the believers are caught up in the rapture before that seven-year tribulation, who disappears with them? In, In one sense, the Holy Spirit who indwells us. He now is away. And now Satan is free to begin his program of destruction, which he does. And and the Bible tells us that the man of sin will then be revealed. And the tribulation will begin. And many people will believe the devil's lie. And they will go whole hog after him and fall down and worship him and put the mark of his his name on on their foreheads. Why? Because... Now there's no Spirit of God hindering them. But don't think God's power won't be displayed. Because during that seven-year period of tribulation, God's power is going to be evident. God sends along his two witnesses, and they display God's power, just like Moses did in Egypt. When those tribulation judgments whether they be the sealed judgments or the the trumpet judgments or the vile judgments, when they are done, it's sort of like these men announce them and it happens. God does these things. Did you know what God's going to do during the tribulation? He is going to send such a solar storm that all the electrical thing grid of the whole world will be wiped out in one moment. I watched a program last night that sort of talked about how we are in danger in our country of having our electrical grid wiped out and what would happen if it did. But I was thinking, that's what God's going to do during the beginning of the tribulation. He's going to wipe out the electrical grid. Cell phones won't work. Nothing will work. All the heating systems are gone. Everything is gone. You won't be able to get gas out of the gas pumps of the gas station to drive your car any place. I mean, it's all going to be pretty bad. Your food's going to spoil because your refrigerator's not going to work. And how many cans of soup do you have in your cupboard to last you for the next seven years? Not much. You see, it's going to be a time when God displays his power. And those two witnesses will do it. And they're going to be blamed for it. And God's going to be blamed. People will be cursing God because he's sending judgment down on them. Well, that that leads us to understand the very fact that God is control over all that he's created. He's in control over governments. Psalm 2 and verses 1 through 5 says, Why do the heathen rage? The people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And what's God's reaction? Here's all these world rulers cursing him and, and all just, just say all manner of evil against God. And it says this. 
the Lord shall sit, that sits in heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath, and vex them in his displeasure. And that's what he's going to do during the tribulation time. That's what he even does today among, with some world rulers who mock him out, who deny him, who push him aside. God just laughs at them. He laughed at Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that in the book of Daniel? Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm the greatest person in the world. I'm the greatest ruler that ever lives. I'm, I'm the powerful, all powerful one. Do you want to see how much power you have? And he turns him into an ox, like an ox eating grass. Seven years. Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson, for this is what he says afterwards. The Most High, the All-Powerful One, rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can stay his hand. Why? He is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. He is the sovereign, powerful, controlling God. But he's also, as we've just seen, the God of judgment, judgmental power. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 22, it says, What is God willing, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long sufferings the vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? Now I have to understand, God is a holy God, and therefore he has to judge sin. But God is also long suffering, and he's not willing that any should perish. So what is his goal? His goal is that everyone would be saved. But not everyone will believe him. People have the opportunity to say yes or no to God. People have the opportunity to embrace the finished work of Christ on the cross for their salvation or reject it. God does not create us as little robots that would have to do what he just says. He, he allows us the opportunity to exercise our human responsibility, which is either to believe him or reject him. And one day God will judge all sin and all sinners at his judgment throne. Just think of some of the examples he's given in scripture. Here's Sodom and Gomorrah. Was God long suffering with them? Certainly he was. Did he want them to perish? No, he didn't. Abraham pleaded and he said, Lord, if there's you know, 50, 100 people in that city who are righteous, would you destroy that? He says, no, I wouldn't. And Abraham got him down to 10 people. If there were 10 people, Lord, would you destroy those cities? No, I wouldn't do it. God is long-suffering. He doesn't want people to perish. But they rejected God. And God sent the fire down from heaven, and Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed and now rest at the bottom of the Dead Sea. Then remember Pharaoh. Oh, Pharaoh, he kept telling Moses, no, you can't go, you can't go. And then finally, after the judgment on the firstborn in Egypt took place and Pharaoh's son died, he said to Moses and all the people told him, get them out of here, get these Jewish people gone. So they, they packed up, they, they were given to all the, the Egyptians, gave them their, their jewels and their money and said, get out of town. And they got out of town. And then Pharaoh had a change of mind. Remember that? So he sends his little army, he leads the army. And so he, he leads them down toward the Red Sea. He's got them, he's got them boxed in at the Red Sea. They cannot escape. Pharaoh's army is coming down. The, the Jewish people that think they're going to get destroyed. Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? Moses puts it before the Lord, and the Lord says, just take your little stick, hit the water in the Red Sea right there on the beach. So he goes up to the beach, he takes his, his rod, and he hits the water, and all of a sudden, here's a highway across the Red Sea. Water banked up on each side. Dry land underneath. And a million Jewish people travel across that highway that God has made through his power. And they go through, and they're safe on the other side. And Pharaoh now has approached, he says, okay, let's go get them. We see that highway too. And so he starts out, he gets out a little bit, maybe a quarter of the way out, a third of the way out. And all of a sudden, 
his, the first thing that happens, all his chariots get stuck in the mud. What mud? There was no mud for the Jewish people, but there's mud for the Egyptians. God is going to judge them. And then all of a sudden, those big walls of water on either side just down on top, and Pharaoh drowns with his army. You know, they did find the body of the Pharaoh who had been drowned. That's a great archaeological discovery. The same time that Moses was passing through the Red Sea. Just think about the people in the wilderness. There was a group that rebelled against Moses' leadership. He says, we had more stuff back in Egypt than we have here. You brought us out here to starve. And they wanted to kick Moses off. They wanted to get rid of him as their leader. And and they were going to become the leaders. And what did God do? God sent an earthquake and swallowed the whole bunch up. And they went down the ground and closed up on top of them. God has the power of judgment. One day... God is going to judge all the unsaved people at what's called the great white throne judgment. The unsaved stand before him. Many of those people were trusting their works to get to heaven, their good works. And God is going to open the book of works and show them that all these good works that they had were selfish works and they don't satisfy his holiness. They deserve judgment. Secondly, he's going to open up the book of life and show them that they had rejected the offer of eternal life. They had refused God's long-suffering, God's mercy, and God's grace. And now they must be cast into the lake of fire, which wasn't prepared for them, but prepared for the devil and his angels. But now that is their eternal resting place, because they've rejected God and they're judged by God. You know, we are all warned in Scripture of God's judgmental power. And in Psalm 2, we're told that uh, we are to repent and trust God. The psalmist writes, kiss or submit to the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in your way. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So God, after he shows the the nations that they can't really rebel against him, that he's in control of them, says, I'm going to judge you, but there's only one way out. And that one way out of judgment is to trust my Son, to trust Jesus Christ. Book of Hebrews tells us, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Well, let's go to number six. This is God's saving power. God has judgmental power, but aren't you glad for the saving power of God? God has a saving power. Here's my proposition. A holy, sovereign God has every right to his judgmental power upon the universe and the world which man has corrupted through his sin and his rebellion against God. However, God has exercised another aspect of his sovereign power, his saving power. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. He's able to save anybody. You, me. The worst sinner you can think of, he's able to save them. The phrase, he is able, shows God's saving power. That saving power provided by Christ through his death and his resurrection. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 gives us this statement. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God has saving power, and his saving power is offered to everyone who will repent of their sin and will trust the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross. You see, the very moment I understand and accept the fact I'm a sinner, and the moment I understand that Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, died in my place, that he died and rose again so I could have eternal life, I could have my sins forgiven, that very moment when I call upon the Lord to be saved, he saves me by his saving power. That's the wonderful truth of Scripture. God's saving power is there. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. He has the power to save. He can save anyone. He can save you. He can save me. That is the work of God. His saving power is realized 
when I come to God by faith. Remember, without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. There was a very wealthy Jewish woman who received a Bible, but she tossed it aside as unwelcomed in her home. In an idle moment, she remembered where she had put that Bible, and she got it out, and she began to read it just out of curiosity to see what these unfamiliar pages were all about. She became interested. She fought against her unbelief. But the Holy Spirit began convicting this Jewish lady of her need of Jesus Christ. And finally, she knelt down in prayer and asked Jesus Christ to forgive her sin and be her personal Savior. Now she wondered, what should I do? She had seen the power of God and salvation in her own life. But she knew it would mean, if she declared this, the loss of her Family, her children, her property, her home, uh, just about everything she had. It would be separation from her husband and her children. Should she remain silent? But then she said, I can't be silent about what God's done in my life. And so she told them that she had trusted Jesus Christ as her Messiah and as her Savior. Well, the family loved her, and they were going to persuade her that she made a stupid, foolish mistake in trusting Jesus. So they took the Bible and tried to use the Bible to prove to her that it wasn't really real. But the more they read the Bible, the more they realized it was real. And all of a sudden, the whole family came to realize the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the power of God to salvation. Now, I trust you understand that. How do I apply omnipotence to my life? How do you apply omnipotence, the power of God, the sovereign power of God in your life? Well, if you're unsaved, you haven't trusted Christ as Savior, you can realize that God has the power to save you, to forgive your sin, to give you eternal life because he's promised to do it. And whatever God purposes, by his power, he can complete in you. He can forgive your sin. He can give you eternal life. He can do it today. Now, if you're saved, how do you utilize the omnipotent, sovereign power of God? Well, one way is to know that God answers prayer. He has the power to answer your prayers. So you come to him in prayer and you pray and God answers prayer. I can just, just looking around, I can see several people who have had answers to prayer just this past week. God answers prayer. Another way to apply it is in the area of witnessing. Remember what Jesus said? You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Well, we, we should be telling other people about the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, he that believes in him should not be ashamed. But a lot of times, we don't know what to say. And humanly, and with our human wisdom, we may not really know how to witness But that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He gives us the power to witness. He enables us to share the gospel. He gives us the words to say just at the right time to the right person so that they can hear the gospel through us. He empowers our witness. Well, what if God calls you to serve him? He wants you, maybe he says, I want you to be a teacher. I want you to be a helper in the, the kids club, or I, I want you to, to help in this other area of ministry in the church. And you say, well, I can't do that. But remember what the Lord said to his disciples? All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go, therefore. The reason we can go and fulfill a ministry God wants us to do is because he gives us the power to do it. He has the power. He is the omnipotent God. He is the all-powerful God. He will empower us to be able to do what he asks us to do. He will never ask you to do anything for him without enabling you to do it. That's his promise. God enables us by the Holy Spirit to fulfill his will. Maybe you're struggling with temptation. Maybe you're struggling with some sin that has brought you into bondage. God's power can break that power over you. 
He can break the power of drugs. He can break the power of pornography. He can break the power of lust. He can win the battles in your life. You can become more than a conqueror through the power of the omnipotent Son of God. He has the power. Now remember, we said God has the power not only to create the universe, but control the universe. But then he tells me that he can have the powers and the affairs of men. He can have power in me because I'm his new creation in Christ. So he controls me. He can, he can guide me through every situation I go into. Every problem that comes into my life, he can give me the power to handle it. He has the power. He could guide us through the storms of life. He could guide us through the times of illness. He can guide us through the valley of the shadow of death. He is there. He never leaves us. And his power proves it. And his power is available to us today. Heavenly Father, make your power real to us. Help us to claim it by faith. Help any who are unsaved today to claim the power of God to salvation. Help believers to claim the power of God to victory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.